Well, a welcome again and a special welcome to those who are watching online or will at a later time. Today we are continuing our series on the book of Mark called Following the Servant King. And the hope and desire of the series has been that as we watch Christ's example, uh, not only are we encouraged by it, but we are called uh, to emulate it in our own life as we seek Him as the Lord and Savior of our life. And so today we are uh, in Mark chapter 4. We're actually concluding this chapter today in a message called Faith is Meant to Show, kind of a compliment uh, to last week's message called Faith is Meant to Grow. And if you missed that message, you can check it out on our YouTube page. I want to encourage you, uh, if you have a Bible with you, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are some in the pew backs there you can use. And of course, if you don't have your own copy of the Bible, be sure to let me know as you exit today, and we'll be happy to get you one. So as you turn there in your Bible, an account is shared from uh, some time ago of a fire that occurred up north. It was an inferno, uh, and this house fire, smoke was everywhere. And one night, it, at the point in this fire that night, uh, a young boy was forced to flee to the roof of the home that was uh, burning. He had been trapped inside, and he had gotten up on the roof. It was dark out. And the father of this boy was on, on the ground by that point, and he stood on the ground below with outstretched arms calling to his son, Jump! Jump, and I'll catch you. And he knew the boy had to jump to save his life. There was no other way that he was going to be able to get out of that fire. All the boy could see, however, were flames and smoke and blackness on top of it already being night out. And as can be imagined, he was afraid to leave the roof. His father kept yelling, jump, jump, I will catch you. But the boy protested, Daddy, I can't see you. I can't see you. The father replied, but I can see you. And that's all that matters. God is like this, seeking that we might have faith not in the outcome, but faith in Him. Faith in Him. And that this faith would result in action and obedience in our life. Again, we are in Mark chapter 4, looking at verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, he being Jesus, let us go across to the other side, speaking to disciples here. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We are called, if we know Christ today as Savior and Lord, if you don't know him today, he is seeking to bring you into his family. We are called to have faith enough to take this faith and to live it out in our life that it can be seen because of this. He has proven himself, he has shown his power, but even yet still, because he is God. And because he loves us. And because he seeks and promises to meet us in our life, whatever the outcome might be, that he will take care of us, he will lead us, he can see us. As we consider that point this day, our first area of focus coming from verses 37 through 39 is this, that we would concentrate on Christ's power. Now at this point in our story, if you've been with us through these sermons so far in our series, Jesus has been teaching all day, really by the point that we meet him in verse 35. So he's been teaching all day. You'll recall from our previous messages, if you've been here for them, that he has concentrated a lot of attention on a lot of big topics. And so if you're new to the Bible, a little insight here for 
a large period of time before he's gotten to this point. He's been talking broadly to all kinds of people about all kinds of spirit, or spirit, spiritual theological depth. Spirological, that's a word I just coined for you. Spiritual and theological depth, and he's communicated this with parables, brought some clarity to his disciples, and so at this point, this has gone on all day, and he's seeking to head across the lake to get to the other location that he'll then do more ministry, we'll visit in time. And so likely before the day ends, he's seeking to make it across this great body of water, what's described as a lake, before uh, the heat comes the next day. He wants to get to this next spot. Verse 36 says that he was taken by the disciples just as he was. Now, that language is used there because he was exhausted. Jesus was tired. He had preached all day, administered all day, and he was weary and tired from the work that he had done that day. You know, we're reminded that Jesus is both fully God and fully man so that he could experience the things that you and I experience, we're told in the Word, so we have a priest who understands us. So even Jesus' body was physically tired from the work that he had done this day. And so the disciples gather him up and lead him to the boat. The boat. In verse 36, we're told as they travel on into 30. Seven, this windstorm arose and suddenly it comes and it's abnormally severe for this area. The language that's used here in Greek, when we look at it, it talks about the severity, which was a little strange. And this period of time at this location, a storm this large, a storm this severe. The exhausted Jesus is laying in the boat at this point. Again, he's been tired from the work he's done. He's now put in the boat and we're told that he's sleeping. Jesus is sleeping. You can relate to this. After a long, weary day of work, you too might find yourself sleeping, sleeping early or maybe taking a nap somewhere. And so Jesus is sleeping as you and I would. But these disciples who are scared, as you and I might be, when a big storm comes that's abnormally severe, they seem to lose faith. They seem to lose faith in Jesus. They question his motive even. Sometimes that happens as God does things in our lives we don't expect or allows things in our lives we don't expect, particularly when we can't see the outcome of those things. We might begin to wonder, God, who are you? Why are you allowing this? What's the purpose here? Again, we talked last week about how faith that God is looking for from us is a simple faith that we would trust him even if we don't know the outcome. We don't know why things are happening. The faith that God is after is one that says, I don't know, maybe I can't know in my human capacity, but I trust that you know, God. I trust that you see me, God. In this case, Jesus was physically with them. You and I might pray to God and we can't physically see him. Jesus was physically with them, and yet even in this moment, their faith is waning. They're questioning his motive. He awakes He addresses the storm directly, this God of creation who can speak to things that you and I cannot. He speaks to this storm directly and instantly it is calmed and the word here indicating total peace. Everything is settled instantly. There's a complete flip. A severe storm, sort of unknown in this region, causing these men to fear for their lives. Jesus speaks, it's calmed, and the whole scenario is changed. The African impala, an animal, can jump to a height of over 10 feet and cover a distance of greater than 30 feet. Yet these creatures can be kept in an enclosure in any zoo with a three-foot wall. The animal will not jump if it cannot see where its feet will fall. We talk about a simple faith in God or a trust in God. Faith, the kind that the Word speaks of, the kind of faith that Christ is seeking for us to have. Faith is the ability to trust what we cannot see because we know that Christ sees us. 
Not because we trust things will work out how we want, but because we trust the one who will work them out as he's promised. Because you see, Jesus, even in his weariness, is still the Lord of nature. Still the God of creation. In this account, we see he commands it and it does what he says. He is Lord of all things to beyond nature. You know, every matter in your life that you're paying attention to right now, every trial, every tribulation, natural or otherwise, He is God of all these things. He is Lord of all things, we're told in this word. So as we consider that this day, we're talking about our faith showing in our life. What do we do with this first point about Christ's power and his ability. This is our why, what, and how. Why does this matter? What do we do and how do we do it? So why does this matter? Because God is unmatched. You know, I've heard for the past two days from people how windy it's been. It's been windy outside, right? Blowing around, leaves. It's been sunny too. And so for the past two days, roughly, I, or when Sheila and I have been together, we've stayed indoors, or we've been in a car, when we had rather been outside. Why is that? Because I can't calm a little wind. I can't calm a little wind. It's windy out, the leaves are blowing around, sure, the sun's out though, and we can't stop a little bit of wind. And so we retreat into the house, we retreat into the car. But we're told in this account that Jesus can calm the very worst of, in this case storms, can calm the very worst of whatever. Can calm the very worst of whatever. He is unmatched in his power, he's unmatched in his control, he's unmatched in his authority, he is unmatched in his ability. And so what do we do? We benefit ourselves, particularly if we're in the crux of some trouble in our life, to marvel at him and marvel at his power. I tell you this is true. This account happened in this scripture as stated in real life and in real time. This is not a story in the terms that somebody put it together. This is a true testimony of something that happened in real life, in real time, with a real Jesus. But in order for you to trust it, if you don't believe those things I've said are true, in order for you to trust it, if you say you believe they're true, but maybe your life doesn't reflect that, in order for you to trust it, you're going to have to dwell on it. And you're going to have to be encouraged by it. You'll need to focus on it. You'll need to study it and think on it. And as you do, you'll see the amazing wonder of God's ability. You know, God in His kindness and in His mercy has given us a Bible, not for the point of just reading it as an academic exercise so we gain more knowledge. He's not given us a Bible just so that we can say, yes, I've heard this account of Jesus calming the storm. If you're a church person today, this is not a new passage to you, but your familiarity with it isn't the key. He's given us this Word so that we might dwell upon and observe in real time through the testimony in of this case, Mark, of what Jesus did in actual life. A real action by a real Jesus. With real power, with real authority, so that we might dwell upon it. And as we dwell upon his work, not just get stuck on the work of Christ, which sometimes we do when we see miracles of God. Sometimes we get, we get raptured by the miracle when the miracle itself wasn't the point. He didn't fix your problems in your life so your problems were fixed. He didn't heal that area you were praying to be healed so that it was healed. And He did not heal it just so that you would suffer. And He did not fix your problem just so that you would languish. But whether God heals or doesn't, whether God calms or doesn't, whether God 
performs a miracle or doesn't. He does these things for this point that you and I might be drawn to Him because our greatest need is this. Not that our storms are calmed. Not that our cancer is healed. Our greatest need is this, that we would know Jesus Christ. And so whatever comes to pass, the things that are the result of sin and its impact on the world that He allows, or the things He intercedes in, in a way that might look like a miracle and everything in between, its purpose and intent is that we might be drawn to Him. That we might be drawn to Him. And so we are called to marvel at this account and others so that we can recognize who Jesus is. Not who Jesus was in some past story from 2,000 years ago, but who Jesus is now, today, at this very moment. And so how do we do that? But one of the ways that we, in the life of the church, are encouraged is as we talk together about the work that Christ has done. Certainly this day, I'm speaking to you from the pulpit about Christ's work here. Shortly after our service today, you'll have time to sit together and eat a meal. Maybe you've got somebody here with you from your family or a friend who you'll see after this day. We are called to talk together about the work of God to wonder about the work of God, that He can calm a storm, that He can stop wind and nature. Yes, that He can heal relationships and heal bodies or whatever else He might do in our life, but the wonder of seeing God do these things. And by the way, maybe we ought to talk a little more about the wonder of the times when God doesn't do anything. And the person who's languishing in that pain rejoices because they know God's with them. Maybe we ought to talk a little more about the times where we prayed that a body was healed and that person wasn't healed. And yet on the closing hours of their life, they exalted and praised God because they knew that He was with them. Because whether He be interceding or not, He is God, He is powerful, He is able, He is good, He is faithful. And we serve ourselves well to dwell upon that. Because that's what we're after. Not faith just because He calms storms, but trust in Him because of Him. Trust in Him because of Him. Asking ourselves this, our second point today, do we believe? Do we believe? We're looking at verses 40 and 41. I'll read those for us again. And He said to them, Speaking to the disciples who were with him, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so Jesus has easily spoken to this storm, calmed it totally, we're told, and the disciples are there. And you can imagine they're likely emotional as you and I would be. First, they're fearing for their life in one moment, and then they're seeing their teacher and master appearing in their minds to not care for their need. And then he wakes up and he calms the storm, which probably brought to them great relief. And then he critiques them. He corrects them. He calls them up from what evidently is faithlessness. In verse 40, Jesus explicitly and directly addresses their lack of faith. Because that's what it is. That's what it is. Would you have been afraid if you had been in that storm? Probably. Maybe. But... Trusting Him means over that fear, over that fear, you know that He's going to take care of it. Over that fear, you know that He's going to take care of it. Any reasonable person would say, if I was in the thick of a storm that was more severe than had been known by me or my family, just out exposed in a boat, some of us might be like, no, I wouldn't be scared. Meet me here. Time, W forecast. We'll see how it works for you. But in the case, trusting God, a lack of awareness of the risk. It's not a lack of awareness of the risk. That's not a concern. What's down the line? Is this or an above here? Above that 
concern over and above that uncertainty, one can say this, I trust that God will take care of this. And sometimes taking care of it means I'm going to die in the storm. But if I know Him, He's going to take care of me. And sometimes trusting He's going to take care of it means that He's going to calm the storm with total peace and I'm going to trust Him because He will take care of me. What Christ is after is not that you would trust in the results, but that you would trust and believe in Him, that His Word is true and what He says He will do, He will do. That's what it means to believe. Christian, hear me today, that's what it means to believe. You may say with your mouth you believe, but do you believe this way? Verse 41 shows they are beginning to register. That real trust is required here. Their alarm and their uncertainty is this. Yes, this is Jesus who just calmed a storm. What a wonder. But they're also beginning to register. Hey, he's, he's, he's saying something to us here. You know, he's... He's penetrating maybe past our ex explanations, our justifications of, hey, it's a big storm, Jesus, what do you expect? Hey, Jesus, you are sleeping, what do you expect? He's saying something that's like cutting right through all of that and getting to something else inside of us. Maybe we haven't thought about much before, which is this question, do we actually have faith? Do we genuinely believe? A question I pose to you this day, if you don't know Christ as Savior as well, do you believe you can it's the call he leaves for you this day as we continue in our word. In April 1988, the Evening News reported on a photographer who was a skydiver. He had jumped from a plane along with numerous other skydivers and filmed the group as they fell and opened their parachute. And on the film shown on the telecast, as the final skydiver opened his chute, the picture went berserk. The announcer reported that the cameraman had fallen and did not survive. Having jumped out of the plane without his parachute, it wasn't until he reached for the absent ripcord that he realized that he was free-falling. Until that point, the jump probably seemed exciting and fun, but tragically he had acted with thoughtless haste. Foolishness. If he had lived, he might have explained it as I didn't know where the parachute was or I wasn't sure what was to happen. Whatever the explanations might have been, he fell to his death. And nothing could save him. Because he had faith in a parachute that wasn't buckled on him. Faith in anything but an all-sufficient God can be just as tragic as spiritually. Only with faith in Jesus Christ dare we step into the dangerous reality of eternity. As this question looms in our minds and our hearts, do we believe in Jesus as Savior? Do we trust Him as Lord? And you see, faith in anything but God and through God is faith in nothing. God alone is able to save, able to calm storms, to help in the most important ways, but you'll have to stop counting on yourself or just wanting God for His work in your life, and you'll have to stop having faith in even what Jesus will do, but instead have faith in Jesus alone. This is what is required and needed for each and every one of us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior today, you would come to me and say, I do not know Christ. I do not know Him as my Savior. I do not know Him as my Lord. I want you to know that as what's required of you is this, that you believe and trust that you are a sinner, that He has died on a cross for your sin, to pay the price that was due you, which was death, that He rose from the grave to give you eternal life if you believe and trust in Him. But I will say as well, if you know Christ as your Savior today, and you've sort have accepted Jesus somewhere in your story and now you're wandering on sure that eternity will come and you'll see him face to face but you're living as if you can do whatever you want and think whatever you want and feel whatever you want I want you to know there's a risk there because the word says this that the proof of your salvation is the fruit that develops out of your faith 
And so if you say you've accepted Christ, maybe you've come down an aisle, maybe you've been baptized, and yet your life does not demonstrate that you do indeed know Jesus, and I want you to know this. You might be jumping out of a plane without a parachute. And you too can come to accept Him and know Him today, just as you might believe you did somewhere back in your story. And so what do we do? This is our why, what, and how for our second point. Why does this matter? matter, excuse me, because God seeks simple faith. Because you see, when God is, what, what God is after in our life, your life and my life, Christian or not, is this, that we would trust Him alone for this life and trust Him for eternity. You don't have to know a lot of theology. You don't have to know a lot of Bible verses, but you have to know this Belief and trust that Christ alone can save you. Belief and trust that Jesus has died on the cross for your sin and risen from the grave. And so what do we do? Well, it's all coming down to you. He's done His work. He saw you even through time that you would be a sinner, that you would need rescue. He saw you that you would need help. He saw you that you would need somebody to pay the price for you. And so He came and He died on a cross, which is how your sins are paid for. Your account is settled with God. The penalty that's due you because of your disobedience to God is death, and He died for you. He saw through time that need was needed, and so He came. We just celebrated it at Easter, and then three days later, He rose from the grave, proving that this price had been paid, proving that He had power over death. And so that has been done. The price is paid. But in order for that to be applied to your life and to your account, you've got to believe. You've got to trust that there is no other way by which you can be saved. That all the good works you've done have benefited you nothing in eternity. You've got to believe that indeed the Word of God is true and that Christ in fact did come and that He indeed was fully God and fully man and that 2,000 years ago in reality, in actuality, He died on a cross for your sin. You've got to believe. You've got to believe that in fact that stone was rolled away and there was no body in that tomb. You've got to believe. The work's been done. Christ has come. He has died, He has risen, and what is left of you and I is this. Do you believe? Do you believe? And again, Christian, that will be evidenced in your life. And so how do we do that? We've got to confess Him today as God. If you wouldn't say you believe in Christ alone as God, if you have never met Jesus, you can today. You can today. This can be the day you say, I trust Him, that I am a sinner, that He died for my sin and rose, that He will forgive me for my sin and He will save me. And if I believe this, I will be saved. And you need to be if you don't know Him, because I want you to know that what is ahead of you apart from Christ is this, separation from God in a place called hell for eternity when you die. There is no help but this. There's one threshold to this, and that is this belief. One threshold. That you would trust Him. That you would take Him at His word. And that's what we're all doing in some ways, right? Because as we sit here today, none of us have yet been to heaven. We're trusting Christ not for the outcome. We don't know the outcome yet because we're not there. And so even as we talk today about just taking Christ at Christ's word, trusting Jesus for Jesus, every single person in this room who professes to know Christ as Savior, that's what you're doing because you haven't been in heaven yet. So this is the ultimate test of our genuine trust. Do we genuinely believe and take Him at His word? There will be an hour coming when that will be seen and known. But before that hour, what's required of us to be with Him is belief. And so this question remains, what will you do with what you've heard? Will you trust Christ for Christ's sake alone? Or are you still waiting for Him to prove Himself? He's calmed a storm. He's died on a cross. What more are you seeking from Him? And if you don't know Christ today, will you believe in Him as your Lord and Savior or just continue in the storm alone? 
trying to figure out how to calm it by yourself. Bow your heads for just a moment. In the silence of your heart, I want you to pray with me. I'm gonna prompt you in this prayer and I want you to call out to God from the places that you are. And first, I want you to take a moment to ask God in prayer to encourage you with the example of his power from our passage today. So take a moment now to pray to God that he would encourage your heart and encourage your trust in him by what you've heard testified to this day. And so go ahead and pray that to God. And now in the silence of your heart as you pray to God, I want you to ask the Lord to grow your trust in Him for His sake, that you would believe Him whatever the outcome. And finally, this day, if you're already a Christian, you already believe in Jesus, I want you to continue to be in prayer over these matters. But maybe today you don't know Jesus yet. You feel God reaching out to you through this word, but you've not yet accepted him. You've heard that he's died for you, that he's risen for you, that his spirit is with you and you want to know him and you're serious about wanting to become a Christian today to follow him with your life. You're willing to change your life for Him. You're willing to give up your sin and follow Him, seek after His Word. Obey Him in your life. You believe only Jesus can save you. If that is you today, I want you to talk to God. That's what prayer is. And first, in the silence of your heart, I want you to tell God in your prayer that you believe that He is good and faithful. And so if this is you today, I want you to take a moment right now to pray to God that you believe that He is good and He is faithful. And now in your prayer, I want you to tell Him that you know that you're a sinner and that you disobey Him. As you continue in prayer, I want you to pray To God, if you believe that this is true, I want you to tell Him that you know Jesus died to take on the punishment for your sin and you want to be forgiven for your sin. And finally, again, if you're sincere in this, you mean this with your whole heart and your whole life, I want you to tell God you're going to live the rest of your life seeking Him in His Word, believing He is true. If you just told God this and you believe it, and you're committed to it, I want you to know that Jesus Christ has saved you this day and God's Spirit has come to dwell in you. And so God, we come together in this moment to pray a prayer of great thanksgiving that you calmed the storm, demonstrating your authority and your power. God, we pray with humility, seeking that you might grow and increase our faith this day. And God, for anyone in this house today who has accepted you as Savior today, we pray a blessing over them as they begin this journey of seeking after you. We pray these things together in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to sing.